many asking for a word for the week. We've decided to record a, a weekly word and uh, make it available to you on YouTube. Uh, we'll be sending you a link for that. So, welcome to the word for the week, first one. You know, some time ago I had a vision of a arrow hitting a bullseye, hitting the mark, you know, right back in the middle of the bullseye. And I prayed about that for some time. The Lord gave me a scripture, and it was from Isaiah 9, uh, 49, verse 1. It says, Listen, O isles, unto me. Listen to me, you people from afar. The Lord hath called, called me from the womb, from the bowels of my mother hath he made mention of my name. And he goes on in verse 2. And he hath made my mouth like a sharp sword, and in the shadow of his hand hath he hid me, a polished as a polished shaft in his quiver did he hid me. Now, I thought about this. This is a prophetic word about the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, and how, you know, he was the arrow that hit the mark. His father was the archer. And we see this in the life of Jesus, you know. It's, it's like Jesus was a man with a mission. He came here with a purpose. There was a plan and a purpose for his life. And he wouldn't and be divided about that. He wouldn't, he kept to the, as it were, the main reason for him being here. And uh, as a child, he was growing up, he was subject to his parents. And when he was 12 years old, we see a little insight into the life of Jesus. And um, it says in Luke 2, 42, and when he was 12 years old, he went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. And it came to pass that after three days they found him in the temple sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. And you see, he's only 12 years old. And his parents said to him, you know, what are you doing? We've been looking for you for a long time. And in verse 49 it says, and he said unto them, how is it that you were seeking me? I must be about my father's business. See, he came to this earth, and they had these interludes in his life, very short interludes. Now we hear nothing more for many, many, many years, because the, he was the arrow that God took and hid in his quiver until the time was to come. And so, after these 12 years, another 18 years passed. We know nothing much about Jesus at all, you know. He was awaiting the fullness of time to finish his mission. Now, what does an arrow speak of? Why was he pictured as an arrow, which his father shot from a bow, and he hit the mark, the bullseye, right in the middle? What was that about? And so what do arrows speak about? Well, first they have feathers that they are on the arrow. That speaks of stability, keeps the, bed, the, the arrow stable. This is very, very important. We'll look at this later because there are many things in the body of Christ now which are creating huge instability and false doctrine. And we need to be aware of those things. Those arrows, that arrow, feathers in the arrow were there to keep him steady and uh, balance the balance it. He's not easily thrown by every wind of doctrine. Then it says it was a polished shaft. Now the arrow has to be dead straight. If it's slightly bent, when it's fired it will go off, miss the target. If there's just one nick, just a little nick in that arrow, the aerodynamic effects of that will take the arrow. And so of Mark, it was a polished shaft, straight, dead straight, highly polished. He was not going to be diverted from his mission and from his mark. A polished shaft. You know, in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 14, it says, 
that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine. That's what's happening today in many places of the body of Christ. In John chapter 14 and verse 30, his, Jesus said this. He said, from now on, I will not talk with you much, because the prince of this world cometh, but he cannot find anything in me. He, the devil saw Jesus protect his life over and over and over again, just to find one entry point, something in his character, a flaw in his character, but he said he couldn't find anything in me. Because of this, he hit the mark, which was the cross, of course. He wasn't diverted either way. In, in Isaiah chapter 49, and verse 2, it says, And he hath made my mouth like a sharp sword, and in the shadow of his hand he hath hid me, and made me a polished shaft, which was hidden the quiver for a while. Many of you have been hidden in a quiver for some time, a long while. And you, you, you're wondering about, you know, what is the purpose? What's the final purpose for your life? He's about to take many out of the quiver. And they'll be polished. They've been polished. They've been through the mill. They've been through adversity. They've been through many things. But they've kept a straight course. The tip of that arrow speaks of the word of God in his mouth. You know, this generation needs to know their destiny. In Psalm 45 and verse 5, it says, The arrows are sharp in the heart of the king's enemy. You see? So Jesus was not distracted. He was not sidetracked. He did what he came for. You've been sent here with a purpose and a plan. We need to do what we came here for without being distracted. The greatest harvest that the world has ever known is very close to beginning. This will be a phenomenal harvest. But the harvest is not the problem. The church is the problem. The harvest will come in. And... Um, I was in a prayer meeting a number of years ago where we were praying for the harvest to come in. And the Lord came and sat right next to me and said, I could have brought in the harvest by now. But the problem is not with the harvest. The problem is the church is not ready. Pray you therefore that he will send forth harvesters into the field. See, you're a pastor of a church. What would you do if suddenly 10,000 people were added to your church? That's the kind of harvest that's coming in, and it will come very, very quickly. And say 10,000 were swept into your church. Most would be caught, caught you know, of God. Are you training your young people to handle this? Are you training your people? How will you handle that kind of thing? We need two things. We need insight into what God is purposing to do. But then we need foresight to know how to handle it. Do you have a plan? There is a wave coming. There is a wave of people being swept into the kingdom of God. Now, the other thing is, we're living in a time of the end of the age. The phrase, the last days, occurs uh, eight times in the Bible. And the number eight occurs 80 times in the Bible. That is isn't quite significant because eight is the end of one season and the beginning of a new. A new beginning. And we're right at that point where the old is passing away now. And the final end time purposes of God will start to unfold. And we're now living in this time. And see, Paul writing to Timothy, he said in 2 Timothy 3, 1, this know also that in the last days, and there's that phrase, the last days, perilous times shall come. Dangerous times. 
perilous times, difficult times. Now, we can just look at the world today. Many, many places in great cities of the world today, there are places in these cities which are no go zones. You just don't go there, it's just too dangerous. Perilous times, difficult times are coming. But the good news is, says in these last days, this phrase again in Acts chapter two seventeen, it shall come to pass in this phrase, the last days I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams. And whosoever, it says in verse 21, the result of this is, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's all that's required. Call on the name of the Lord. In this time, perilous times that are coming across the earth today, many are going to start to call upon the name of the Lord. Oh, it says, and whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's all it would take for these people to be saved. Now, Peter talks about the church in these last days in Second Peter uh, chapter 3 and verse 3. Knowing that first, now notice the word first, they shall come in these last days, scoffers walking in their own lusts and saying, where is? is the promise of your coming. For since our fathers died, all things continue as they are. Now it was as, as they are from the beginning of creation, he said. There is a doctrine, a very, very dangerous doctrine that's taking hold in many parts of the church today, particularly charismatic churches. And it is the doctrine of amillennialism. It, it is Greek word our millennium is no millennium it's a rejection of the belief that jesus would have a literal thousand year reign in this earth this doctrine generally teaches that the church could continue on for many hundreds of years yet as it slowly gets it to act together and slowly you know brings the kingdom of god into the earth that so we've got a lot a lot of time but there is no physical millennium where Jesus will rule on this earth. Remember what he said, Peter said in, in 2 Peter 2, 3, knowing that first there shall come those who are saying, you know, where is the second coming of the Lord? Where is the promise of his coming? Our fathers thought about this, but it didn't happen. Where is the promise of his coming? Things will just continue just as they are. Let me tell you this. Things are not going to continue just as they are. We are on the brink of a huge change in the earth. So beware of this doctrine. It is a doctrine is designed to keep the church unprepared for the coming of the Lord. Oh, we've got many, many, many years. It's okay. Yeah. Maybe another thousand years before Jesus returns. It's a deception. And the deception comes from demons. Which is, And the purpose of this deception is to keep the church from being ready for the coming of the Lord. You see, Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 25, verse 1. He said, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise, five were foolish. And they that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them, but the wise took oil in their vessels and with their lamps. Now we're familiar with this passage of scripture. It goes on to say, While the bridegroom tarried, they all slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go your wife to meet him. And all those virgins rose, trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said, and to the wise, give us some of your oil, for our lamps have gone out. I didn't really see it. The lamps have gone out. These are Christians. They're all virgin. They're Christians. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for you and me together. But go rather to them and sell and buy for yourselves. 
So, while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door shut. Afterwards came also the other virgin, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. Then he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for you know not the day nor the hour when the Son of Man cometh. These were all Christians. Some had lost their oil in their lamp. And at midnight, see, close to midnight, which will usher in a thousand years of reign of Christ on the earth. Paul said this to Timothy, 1 Timothy 4.1, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly in the latter times, the last days. The other phrase again. Some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. But strong language. In the latter times, He's talking about many will leave the tried and true doctrines, the basic doctrines, they'll fall away from it. And one of those doctrines is a doctrine of hyper grace. It is a doctrine of demons. And these demons have a specific purpose with this doctrine. And the term hyper grace has been used to it's a describe a new wave of teaching that emphasizes the grace of God to the exclusion of all other vital teachings in the Bible. For instance, to the exclusion of repentance of sin. They teach we don't have to repent anymore because it's all been taken care of. Well, there are dozens upon dozens of scriptures which would contradict that. Hypergrace teachers maintain that all sin past, present, and future, has already been forgiven. So there's no need for the believer to confess it. Well, the Bible doesn't teach that. I mean, you, you have to be pretty dull to believe that. Because the Bible is, you know, the teachings of Jesus. Repent, repent. So the conclusion of this hypergrace teaching is that we're not bound by the teachings of Jesus. They teach that everything that Jesus said before he died on the cross is not valid for us today. That is getting close to blasphemy. So the Sermon on the Mount has no meaning for us today. That was before the cross. It was Old Covenant. And the Bible clearly says all scripture, all scripture is given for our understanding and doctrine. All scripture. Jesus' words to the seven churches in the book of Revelation strongly conducted that idea because it says, repent, 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 and he's talking to the church way after Jesus died on the cross. Repent, repent. They go on to teach further that God never brings judgment anymore on the world or on the church. He no longer judges the nations for their sin. In, he does not judge people for their sin. We need to understand how far this has gone, fallen from the truth. The problem is, that's just this one stage. The final stage of this doctrine will end up by them teaching that there is no hell. Please watch, listen to me. That's where it's going. There will be no hell. In short, hypergrace teachers pervert the grace of God into licentiousness and immorality. Second Thessalonians 2 2 says that don't be shaken in mind and be troubled neither by spirit or word nor by letter from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for first that day shall not come until the first of falling away. That's what's happening right now across many, many churches. Falling away from basic standards, falling away from the basic word of Jesus, words of Jesus, falling away from the truth. 
falling away from sound doctrine. Let no man deceive you, he said. There will come a falling away. So there's a great falling away. It's happening right now. Jesus will not come if at first there is a falling away. There's a reason for that. Jesus clearly said that before the harvest comes in, the chairs have to be removed. That was very, very clear in Matthew 13, verse 24. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like unto man which sowed seed in his field. But man, when he slept, his enemy came and sowed tares and, uh, among the wheat and went their way. That's what the enemy is doing, sowing false doctrine into the church. Hyper grace. Owing doctrine that is so far removed from the word of God in order that a people will not be ready for the coming of the Lord the bride will not be ready and so when the church was asleep his enemy came so tears into the wheat and went his ways but when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit then appeared the tears also in the church so the servants of the household that came said, Didn't we not sow good seed in the field? Where have these tears come from? And he said unto them, The enemy has done this. The devil has done this. The enemy has done this. So the servants said, Well, wilt thou go? How do we gather him up? But he said, No, no, no. He said, No. Lest while you gather the tares, you'll root up the wheat with them. Let them, now listen to me, let them grow until the time of harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, Go ye first, remove the tares, bind them in the bundles, and burn them. But gather the wheat unto my barn. You see, when tares are sown among the wheat, you can't tell the difference until it's harvest time. Now what happens, tares grow very, very straight all the way. And the wheat grow very, very straight. But when it comes to harvest time, the wheat has so much weight there at the top, it bends over. The weight, you'll find the wheat bends over with all the grain they're carrying at the top. But the tears are standing straight up. They don't bow over. And he said, you'll know the tears. You'll be able to discern the tears from the wheat. And what does that bending over speak of? It speaks of humility. And we need to understand that. You know, the, the false hyper-grace doctrine. And there's no humility in that at all. We are fast coming to the greatest harvest the church has ever known. Millions upon millions of souls are going to come into the church. But the tares will be removed. You be careful you're not into a false doctrine, which are the tares. You be careful you're not in a church, which are tares, false doctrines, our millennialism, hyper grace, departing from the truth. So that the church is not ready. The bride is not making herself ready. Now listen to me. The Bible says that the harvest is precious to the Lord. James 5, 7. Be patient therefore, brethren, coming of the Lord. Behold, the husband when waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth. That's the harvest. He's waited a long time and has long patience for it until he received the early and the latter rain. We're coming to the point where the early and the latter rain are going to be poured out in the earth at the same time. Now that's important because um, be your patient, establish your heart because the coming of the Lord draws near, he said. The Lord is not going to allow this harvest to come in and be reaped by churches who are in false stock. 
greatly damage the new believer. He is going to remove fear. Don't find yourself in a church that is preaching false doctrine, that of tears. Very important time. It's a, it's a, it's a, a tactic of the devil to stop the church maturing. There are many trends sweeping the church like never been before because Satan knows the harvest is close. Let them grow together. This harvest is going to be so great. One of the times the Lord spoke to me about the harvest and he, he used the word, it will be of exponential growth. That, if you understand exponential growth, for instance, if 50 thousand people lead three people to the Lord in a year you know that sound um, you end up with the people that you started with at two thousand people being saved now if you continue that trend for say four or five years you have countless millions who have come to the Lord countless millions there are billions of people who are going to be saved. But I want you to be clear on one very thing. He is not going to allow this harvest to be brought into churches of false doctrine. I don't care if you're Pentecostal, charismatic, whoever your church is. Amalemism is sweeping. It's not new, but it's sweeping through the churches again. Hyper grace which is really bad doctrine. Sweeping the churches again. Those churches will be removed one way or another. Those leaders will be removed one way or another. The tears will be removed from the church before the harvest will come in. We're right there, the beginning of the harvest. Okay. Took the arrow and he shot the arrow and it hit the mark. That shaft of the arrow speaks of our character. It speaks of holiness. It speaks of truth. The feathers on the end kept us from falling into doctrines that are with doctrines of demons. In other, in other words, we need to walk in holiness and truth, righteousness, in order to hit the mark which God has called to us in these last days. Let's pray. Lord, we just pray, people listening to this, that you'll give them understanding, revelation, insight, that will keep them on a path. And like an arrow, they will hit the mark in these last days for which you've called them to. Not being distracted, sidelined, by false doctrines of demons, there is coming a falling away, Lord. Pray that your people will understand this. I walk in righteousness and truth. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you today. <laughs>